Welcome everyone to this lecture on software product lines. In today's lecture, I will talk about development processes. So what is the process to develop a software product line? Uh, the slides are joint work with uh, Elias Küter from University of Magdeburg and with Timo Kera from University of Bern. In the last lectures, uh, we already covered a couple of topics. For instance, we talked about ad hoc approaches to variability, uh, where we've seen that uh, people in industry uh, uh, or in development at all are using different mechanisms, uh, typically if they are not aware of uh, better techniques. Uh, then we talked about uh, modeling of features uh, of the configuration space. And then we talked about different um, implementation techniques uh, to realize the vision of software product lines in the last three lectures. In this lecture, we want to give an overall picture how the development happens by means of any of those implementation techniques, uh, but also how it is connected to feature modeling, what happens when, and we will also see that there are further steps needed, for instance, quality assurance, and we will come to those then in later lectures in more detail. So this lecture is divided into three parts again. First, we will talk about a process model for product lines. So this is a very generic process model, but rather gives you an understanding uh, what are the main ingredients to product line development. In the second part, we will give again an overview on the implementation technique that we've covered so far. And this will be uh, also uh, kind of a summary for those implementation techniques, but we will also compare them in more detail. So this is actually not new information in this course, but it's rather like um, an overall summary and conclusion of the things that we said in the last three uh, uh, or in the last uh, six lectures. And then in the third part, we will look at adoption strategies. So if you imagine you are in a company and you have heard of product lines and this is a great thing and you really want to do this, then the question is how to start. So how do you start introducing a product line in a company? And we will talk about this as uh, under the umbrella of adoption of product lines. So again, we already talked about implementation techniques. So this is the main focus of uh, the lecture. So lectures two and three were about implementation techniques, but also the lectures five, six, and seven have been on implementation techniques. But the question is, how are they connected to requirements engineering? How are they connected to testing later on? How is uh, all of this connected to feature modeling, for instance? And when we look at classical uh, development, this is known as the software life cycle. Uh, the software life cycle uh, consists of different phases that we have during development. Uh, and this includes analysis, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. And this is uh, the famous project cartoon that I'm also using in other uh, courses, for instance, introductory courses on software engineering. So, uh, what this visualizes is that there are uh, typically many people involved in software projects that have different uh, roles uh, during the project and we have different uh, kinds of views. So for instance, analysis, we want to understand what the customer uh, wants, but it's very clear that without building the actual system, we will not be 100% correct on what the customer actually needs. And this is part of, I mean, this is part of requirements engineering. There are many things involved, what can go wrong. But also part of this is because the customer cannot even communicate what he uh, really wants uh, until the actual uh, product is built. Uh, so we see that uh, the, uh, uh, the thing here can actually not be used. So the designers make it work, uh, but this is probably not the best idea for the tree. So the implementation uh, looks different. Uh, so it will save the tree. And uh, for testing, uh, it's a bit uh, yeah, problematic because not everything is there already to be tested. And then we have maintenance. We will not talk uh, so much today about maintenance, but rather um, uh, uh, keep, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this in the last lecture of the semester. So when it comes to those process models, process models are uh, models that give us 
like kind of uh, a strategy how to uh, do all those phases, how to connect those phases. And in single system engineering, when developing a single software system, there are uh, there's a multitude of different um, process models, for instance, the waterfall model, the V model, or Scrum. Uh, there are many other models. Um, but the point is, they are not focusing on product lines. They're not uh, keeping like, or are not dedicated to the reuse that we want. So the question is, how do process models for product lines look like? And we already talked about some phases in more detail. For instance, we talked about the design. We talked about design patterns and how they can be used to uh, support variability and product line development. Uh, we also talked about implementation uh, techniques, uh, many implementation techniques uh, with different advantages and drawbacks. But the question is how to connect those uh, to analysis, to testing and maintenance. And we will talk about this in more detail in this lecture. So something to recap is that we are developing a product line designed and specific to a particular domain. And domain will be a term that will be heavily used in this part of the lecture. So uh, let's recap what a domain is. A domain is an area of knowledge that is scoped to maximize the satisfaction of requirements of its stakeholders. That means that uh, we kind of a domain cannot be arbitrarily large, but it needs to be scoped, it needs to be uh, selected well in order to be useful for uh, actual customers in order that our product line will be successful. It includes a set of concepts, terminology understood by practitioners in that area. That means um, it doesn't make sense to develop the software without incorporating uh, the domain knowledge, the knowledge of the people that will later on use the software. So we need to also uh, yeah, uh, use terminology of that domain when building software for it. Because keep in mind that software is in most cases um, a solution that aims to solve problems in a certain domain. And the third point is it includes the knowledge of build software systems or parts of software systems in that area. And that means this is knowledge that developers received over time when developing similar software systems. So this is a domain and this is what we already introduced in lecture one and we talked again about this in lecture four when it comes uh, when it was coming to feature modeling. So how does a process model for product line engineering look like? And the main idea is that we split the development into two phases, into two very general phases. Uh, there will be more detailed phases in those, but we basically have two phases and one main phases and one is for the product line and one is for the products. So we distinguish whenever we do something that is uh, yeah, intended to be reused uh, in terms of the overall product line, whenever we think about uh, the overall product line, uh, from those activities that are devoted to produce a particular product for, for instance, a certain customer. And these two phases are known as domain and application engineering. Let's first look at domain engineering. And we see that the term domain is in there. So we are doing some engineering that is not devoted to a single software. So it's not called software engineering, although this is the, the broader term. So domain engineering is a kind of software engineering, but it's the process of analyzing the domain of a product line and developing reusable artifacts. So this is even maybe a bit too short because there are other uh, things we will see in a minute that also come into play <clears throat> when it comes to domain engineering. So the idea of domain engineering is we have development for reuse. We have reuse as the main overall theme where we want to uh, yeah, enable uh, that artifacts can be reused, that uh, certain requirements, documents, whatever can be reused. So we are preparing artifacts that will later on be used somehow in products and uh, but uh, they will be used then and they will be used during application engineering. And we'll talk to that uh, on that in a minute. 
So the overall goal of domain engineering is to reduce the effort for each product. So the effort when it comes to the development in terms of a single product, we want to reduce this effort as much as possible uh, by means of some upfront investment. And we already introduced this in the first lecture. So the second part, I mean, we have two main phases. One is domain engineering. The other is called application engineering. Application engineering has the goal of developers to, of developing a specific product for the needs of a particular customer or other stakeholder. So the goal of application engineering is to produce a product that uh, is really, that is uh, a product that can be used as is that fits, that is customized to a particular use case. So application engineering overall is the development with reuse, um, where we reuse some artifacts that have been produced in domain engineering. So we are building products around these artifacts that have been produced. Um, and this is kind of repeated for every product. So this is not that we're doing once domain engineering and once application engineering, but application engineering is something that we do again and again when it comes to different products. We will later on discuss also that uh, this uh, is not always feasible, that we do some, do have some extra effort uh, for every product. Uh, but for now, let's keep in mind that we just want to separate those two. Like whenever we're talking about reuse, about the product line development, and whenever it comes to the development of a product. So why is it not called product engineering? Uh, I mean, that's the term that is used in the literature. So we have to live with this. Uh, application engineering, we can think of it like it's an application of the product line. So we have designed the product line to be customizable, to be reusable. There are some artifacts that can be reused in different products. And we are applying this product line for the needs of a particular uh, customer or for particular requirements in that domain. And uh, overall, this means it's not only a technique for application software, uh, but it's also, right, so application software running on uh, desktop, uh, desktop uh, or like uh, apps uh, in the marketplace or something like this, but also uh, this can be used and is heavily used for system software. So overall, uh, I already uh, said that domain engineering and application engineering cover uh, a couple of uh, or multitude of different phases internally. And basically, we can see this as a duplication of the overall software lifecycle, because we have the software lifecycle now on the product line level. And this is called domain engineering. And here we are talking about requirements. Uh, we will have the domain analysis that takes those requirements. Uh, we will think about designs that can be reusable. Uh, we will de design the architecture, but also um, the uh, fine-grained uh, uh, design of the system. Uh, we will have some domain implementation. So we will provide some artifacts. We will implement something for that domain, for that product line. And then we have finally uh, domain testing, where we try to test something already. We want to test the reusable artifacts already somehow. So um, the second thing is that we uh, uh, have kind of a replication of the overall process because we have to do similar steps again when it comes to it, a certain application. And so we kind of we have a duplication of all those icons here, uh, identifying those different phases that we've seen before. But now they are all devoted to a particular product. So it's not about reuse about this overall big picture, but now it, it comes to like producing this one product for this one customer. So there are certain product requirements. Uh, we do have an analysis phase again, where we analyze those requirements. Uh, we compare them with the domain analysis or the results of that. Uh, we will uh, have some application design, so we will try to reuse as much as possible from the design of the product line, but we might also have some custom design here. The same holds for the implementation and for the testing, and then we will have the final product. So you see there's a slight difference. So domain engineering does not really uh, produce actual products, but the products kind of emerge 
after this overall process of domain and application engineering. And now we will talk about those, all those phases in more detail. So first of all, analysis is the process of like uh, uh, considering all the requirements, documenting all the requirements, collecting them, and trying to find out what what is the problem that is to be solved by means of software and what kind of software uh, are we going to need? So what are the requirements on this software? And we have this analysis phase split into two parts, into the, the domain part and the application part. So the domain analysis is a requirements analysis for a product line. So we are looking at the domain a product line is located in and the domain is typically much larger than what our product line can actually uh, yeah, uh, satisfy. So a product line is even more scope. So we define the scope of a product line in a domain. So in that domain, we will have like a solution that only fits for some use cases. Uh, we will not have a software that can uh, uh, yeah, cope with any possible uh, implementation in a certain domain. And this breaks down to the question, what are the features that are in scope? Which features are not in scope? Which combinations of features are in scope? Uh, do we need all the possible combinations of those features or will we, uh, with some combinations of features not be needed? For instance, there might be alternative features and we can model this in a feature model. So the result of a domain analysis is typically a feature model in which features are mapped to requirements. So features, again, are an abstraction of a domain. So we have some terminology to, be, to describe some uh, concepts in our domain. And they're typically mapped to more detailed requirements. So one feature is typically mapped to a multitude of requirements that uh, define in more detail what this feature is about. And then it comes to the process of domain scoping. So which requirements of a domain are in scope for the product line, which are not? And what happens there is that domain experts collect the requirements from existing systems, from interview, from potential customers, because uh, at the product line uh, analysis level, uh, it's, it's not necessary to talk about all the later customers uh, already, but we might have some potential customer in mind that uh, uh, we can think of their possible requirements already. And often uh, this domain scoping is a pure economical uh, decision by managers. So managers will decide, is are we uh, focusing on this feature or not? And uh, we will see that in practice, this is uh, typically driven by economical decisions. And then we have application analysis. So, what are the requirements for a particular product, for a particular customer? Uh, this is based on the output of the domain analysis. So we will try to use, we use the feature model. We will try to reuse the features being mapped to requirements, uh, the features at all as domain concepts where people can think about this um, because requirements, we typically have too many requirements that customers want to select every possible requirement, whether this is needed for them or not. But people think in terms of the features that the software provides. And now we're using the feature model and make a selection. What are the, what are the required features? What are, which features are selected for a particular product? And now it's a question, um, in the best case, uh, Application analysis is simply a selection of the existing features, and then we are done with the analysis part. But in practice, there, uh, there are uh, more complex situations. For instance, if we have new or unsupported requirements, some requirements that were not envisioned in domain analysis already, right? There could be, uh, we're talking about potential customers in domain analysis, so there could be further uh, customers, there could be requirements by customers or feature wishes uh, that are not uh, have not been uh, envisioned before in domain analysis. And the question is what to do with them. Uh, there are basically three different strategies. Uh, first, we can say uh, they are out of scope, right? So we can say uh, we, when we uh, check the requirements of this customer and we will say it's not 
economical for us to provide a solution in terms of this product line for this particular customer because these requirements are too conflicting to those requirements that we have in our product line or it's too far away from what we envisioned the product line to be. Uh, then we might uh, want to uh, yeah, have some custom development um, uh, and we have some development in application engineering so we develop something not in terms of the product line that can be reused by all the potential future customers and all the other customers but then we only develop this custom for this particular uh, customer and then we have the third strategy uh, which is uh, yeah basically we integrate this again into domain analysis so we if we understand that this these are actually important requirements, important for the features, important changes to features, then we incorporate those again into domain analysis. So we are going back to domain analysis. And uh, there's not a single uh, solution for this. So it depends on the use case. It depends on the specific situation. What is the best strategy uh, at hand? Uh, so when we look at domain scoping in practice, uh, uh, we will also see that domain scoping is not always that easy and sometimes even uh, you could argue that it is uh, there's some scoping missing. Uh, for instance, uh, it's been a while, uh, I think in 2019, when I configured a Toyota Aigo uh, for research purposes and I was looking what are the available options and you can even choose covers for your mirrors. So the first decision during domain scoping that ha has to be done as an automotive manufacturer is, do we want to have mirror covers? And here the decision was, yes, we want to provide mirror covers. Uh, users should be able to choose uh, mirror covers. And then the question is, the next question is, do we want to have different mirror covers for the left and the right side? So you see that um, we can choose a certain color for the left side, but we can choose uh, in the same color for the other side, but also uh, we can choose another color for the other side. So the question is, do we want to have this? And are different colors at different um, sides of the car, are these in scope or not? So here the decision was that they are in scope. And then the question is, are multiple uh, covers for the same side allowed? And as you can see from this configurator, I was even be able to uh, to configure uh, many more covers than uh, they can actually uh, use for this car. So I have some spare parts in terms of uh, if I break some, uh, some mirrors, uh, I can have new covers later on and ch exchange them. And then the question is how many colors, which colors are available? And we see this is just a, a subset. I think there were about 20 different colors available and you could even order all of them. But interestingly, you could nav not order uh, the same color tries for the same uh, uh, side of the car. In other part, I mean, this was more like hardware and colors and who cares for software, right? But we have similar, similar things going on for software. So when it comes to the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel is interesting uh, from um, um, like a software engineering perspective because it's a project where many people all over the world are developing on this project and it, is like designed to be able to be customized to many different architectures and to many different in within those architectures uh, to many different um, yeah setups different hardware and so on and what is interesting if we look over time that different architectures have been introduced in the kernel um, uh, over here we see that different architectures were available in 2002 and in 2022, we see, or 2023, we see that not all of the architectures are still supported anymore. So what's, what's going on here is that there's some domain scoping. And this domain scoping basically says that, do we want to support a particular architecture? 
And of course, there are more fine-grained uh, scoping decisions. So for every architecture, we want to decide what are the features that are uh, supported. But these, you can think of this like high-level features. And we have about 20 CPU architectures uh, that are carefully maintained. And to keep it manageable, uh, we, at some point in time, we have to decide certain architectures are not supported anymore. So you see right now that uh, x86 is still supported, but we see that many, uh, uh, even though this is like the, the Linux kernel, uh, there are many distributions of Linux uh, which are not supporting x86 anymore. So it's a question, how long uh, will this be supported anymore uh, by the Linux kernel? And this requires an answer to, is this, still, is this architecture still used by a relevant number of people? If there are too few people, then the overall maintenance effort is not worth uh, all this additional effort to keep track of this additional architecture. So we talked about analysis in much detail. Uh, let's come to domain and application design. So how do we... Uh, what is the architecture of the system? What is the architecture of the product line? What is the architecture of different products? Uh, so domain design is the development of a reference architecture. This could be client server or pipe and filter architecture. And reference architecture means that this architecture is kind of common to all the different products in a product line. Uh, so it's a common high level structure for all the products. And one of the particular decisions during domain design is what implementation technique will be used during domain implementation. So will we use runtime variability, clone and own? Will we use conditional compilation? Will we use modular uh, implementations uh, such as components? Or will we even want to modularize cross-cutting concerns in terms of features or aspects? And even combinations thereof are possible, right? So we talked about those, and we will talk about those again in more detail in the next part of the lecture. And then in application design, we will create an application architecture. And this can be uh, completely automatically derived from the reference architecture so that nothing else needs to be changed. But this could also involve that we have some extensions to the architecture, that we have some more uh, design patterns being used that were not needed overall. Uh, and this application design is based on the feature selection. So we find the feature selection in application analysis. And this is then the input that is being used when designing the product for uh, a particular customer. And we might have some design decisions that are application specific. So this comes back to the how to handle uh, unsupported requirements. And if we decide to support this requirement, but not on the product line level, but just for this particular customer, then we might have need uh, some additional implementation and also some additional uh, design documents, uh, some uh, architecture or design decisions. Then it comes to domain and application implementation. And again, this is split onto implementation for the product line and implementation for products. Uh, so the domain implementation is a development of reusable artifacts. We've seen several techniques, and we'll talk about them again in more detail in the next part. Uh, we will basically implement the features identified during domain analysis. So this is, this is coupled to the previous decisions that we've had. We created a feature model, we created a reference architecture, and now we are implementing those features. We are implementing this reference architecture in domain implementation. And the implementation largely depends on the implementation technique chosen in domain design. Then we have application implementation. Uh, so the de development of products based on those reusable artifacts and this can be a manual laborious process for some techniques, for instance, like components or clone and own. But this can also be fully automated when we think of conditional compilation. So full automation is not feasible uh, when custom development is needed. So even if I'm saying I'm using conditional compilation, it could be that I still have something to do during application uh, implementation, even though I can automatically generate my product. I may have decided to implement some of the requirements, some of the features 
only for the specific, uh, specific customer. So when it comes to application specific requirements, then we will uh, need some custom development here. And full automation is not feasible for clone and own, for components, for services. For components, we have talked about blue code before. For services, we have some service um, organization orchestration, for instance. And for clone and own, we have to clone uh, one of the existing systems and adapt it to our needs. Then uh, let's at least briefly talk about the main and application testing. And again, we are trying to have to push as much as possible of the effort into domain testing in terms of uh, instead of application testing. So we want to have some validation and verification of reusable artifacts already. So before building particular products for particular customers, we already want to test our implementation at least to some extent. So we want to develop reusable tests uh, that can be reused for different products, but also for the product line level. Uh, we want to test features in isolation to some extent or the product line artifacts uh, in some extent. We will talk about techniques in lecture 10. And we will also test some sample products, which means that these are not, not necessarily products that will be ordered by different customers. So if you think of a car, then uh, we do not know what are the configurations that customers wish later on, but we rather try to build, let's say, uh, three different cars that try to cover as much as possible uh, from the overall configuration space. And we will talk about this again in more detail in lecture 11. And then we have application testing. So when we have new, developed new artifacts that need to be tested, so we also have some testing of the application, uh, we can reuse some test artifacts from domain engineering, but we might need some new test artifacts for custom developments. So when we come to back uh, to our overall picture, we have these two main phases, domain engineering and application engineering, and then we can look how they are connected. So the input for domain analysis are the product line requirements. So we analyze the domain. We see what are the possible requirements from the outside, from potential customers, uh, from interviews, from whatever, uh, from expertise of the developers, because domain analysis is typically not done by people that build uh, a database for the first time, but they have been building databases for the last 20 years, so they have some expert knowledge already. Uh, so then we have domain design, and for domain design, we use the feature model as input. So the feature model is typically the output of um, domain analysis. It's not the only output because we also have requirements documented, we have a mapping from features to requirements, and this all is um, incorporated. Um, into domain design. And then we already talked about this, that domain design builds a reference architecture. So the reference architecture is then be used as one of the inputs, but uh, domain implementation will use all the possible inputs. It will also use the feature model. It will also use the requirements documents to understand which system, what we use about artifacts need to be built. And then those will be tested uh, so, which basically means uh, we have some, um, yeah, uh, that was the reference architecture, and uh, we have some reusable artifacts. So, this overall um, uh, part of this picture illustrates why we do have some upfront investment, because so far, We've not built anything for a particular customer. We've only had effort that we spend into the product line, but not into an actual product. And now it comes to the requirements of a particular customer, and those will be handled in application analysis. And application analysis and application engineering in general tries to use as much as possible from the existing artifacts. So for instance, it will use the feature model during analysis. And then the question comes into play how to handle uh, parts of the, uh, yeah, uh, of the requirements that are not supported. And there are two ways to go. Uh, one is to give some 
uh, requirements back into domain analysis, develop them uh, in domain engineering, or we might uh, decide to have some custom development, meaning that uh, we will uh, yeah, then later on have some custom development going on. Uh, and if we have custom design, we have a custom implementation and also a custom um, uh, a custom uh, testing process, right? So this is something that we've seen before on the previous pictures that we might have some uh, additional effort in terms of requirements that we only realize, only fulfill for a particular customer. And, um, but still there's effort because we need to uh, uh, generate and sometimes we even need to build uh, reusable artifacts, um, uh, glue code. Uh, we want to combine, for instance, with components and application implementation, we then combine those components using glue code. So there's some further implementation going on. And later on, all of this results in a certain product. And of course, at any position, we can decide that some that, that to give something back to the implementation. So basically, uh, anything developed in domain engineering will at some point in time be feedback into the domain engineering. Because for instance, the custom development that we've uh, just built, uh, this might be interesting for also for other customers. So we kind of lift this to the product line level. So before we stop this part of the lecture, there are two more uh, important terms when it comes to product lines, and these are known as problem and solution space. So the problem space takes this perspective of stakeholders and their problems, requirements, and views of the entire domain and individual products. Features are, in fact, domain abstractions that characterize the problem space. So we talked about this in lecture four, especially also in the introductory lecture to some extent. Uh, if we think of a feature model, then this is a problem space, typically a problem space artifact describing what are the features in our domain, what are the valid combinations of features. And when it comes to uh, configuration, a selection of those features, this is also considered the problem space. So if we look at our diagram, then we will find the problem space basically to the left. So over here, we will have the problem space, right? And this is independent of whether uh, we are talking about the product line at all or just a particular product. If we talk about the configuration of a particular product, then this is still the problem space view, we are taking the perspective of the requirements of the problem that is to be solved by means of our software. And then on the other hand, the question is, how is the, the rest of it called? And the rest of it is, is called solution space. And the solution space represents the developers and vendors perspectives. So it's characterized by the terminology of the developer, uh, which includes names of functions, classes, program parameters. So implementation details, uh, realization details, design patterns being used, and so on. Uh, the solution space covers design, implementation, validation, verification of features and their combinations in suitable ways uh, to facilitate systematic reuse. And this was something that we talked about already in most of the lectures. We talked about this in lecture two and three when it com was coming to ad hoc uh, representations of variability. But we also talked about this in more structured techniques um, when uh, we were talking about conditional compilation and other uh, uh, things to implement um, product line. And solution space, uh, one of the things that uh, we see here is uh, conditional combination by means of preprocessors. So these are artifacts that are produced as a solution to this product line. And so basically, uh, when we are looking at the overall big picture, then solution space involves everything that starts with domain design, domain implementation, domain testing, but also application design, implementation, and testing. 
So in this part, we talked about domain engineering, which consists of domain analysis, domain design, domain implementation, and domain testing. On the other hand, application engineering, which consists of basically the same phases, but only uh, scope to particular product. And then we talked about domain scoping, about product line requirements, about product requirements, and also about problem and solution space. So there's some further reading. And something to think about for now is where to spend more resources. Shall we spend more resources in domain engineering or in application engineering? And maybe to make this more explicit, what should not be done in domain engineering? Because you could always argue, well, let's let's try to do all the all whatever we can do in domain engineering. But then, do you have examples what should not be done in domain engineering? I hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope to see you again in the next video. Bye.